folks, my name is Ben Whirling. I am an extension educator with Michigan State University. Um, in a normal year, we have a, an Oceana research tour in West Michigan, and it really showcases the, um, what I have um, sincerely believe is a really unique partnership between our vegetable growers and our researchers. Um, and it's really <clears throat> um, two pieces of the puzzle. They, they really go together and work well together um, to get work done for the good of the industry. So we're not able to do that in person this year, um, but we're going to do that instead um, virtually. Um, <clears throat> so normally at the end of our research tour, we have industry sponsored refreshments, but today hopefully, um, hopefully you'll be refreshed with, will quench your thirst for knowledge. Um, so um, today we'll have five um, presenters and I will introduce each presenter. Um, they'll then have pre-recorded content that will play, but each presenter is with us live. And so at the end, they will share, unmute themselves and show their video so they can talk with you. So how can you communicate with them? We, we really want your questions because this can be a good conversation. Um, please submit those questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. And we will answer um, whatever questions we have time for at the end of each um, presentation. And the ones we don't get to, we'll talk about at the end. Um, there are CCA credits and RUP credits available for today. And at the end of um, our time together, there'll be a link placed into the chat and you can click on that and fill out a survey um, so we can get your information and get you those credits. That information will also come out in a follow-up email. And I think, um, I think with that, we are um, pretty much ready to go. Um, <clears throat> well, we're going to start off with asparagus. Um, our first presenter is Jennifer Zavonitska. She is a graduate student in our vegetable entomologist, Dr. Sophia Zendry's lab. And she has been doing work on the overwintering biology of asparagus beetle, um, as well as its control. And so shortly here, we are going to hear about um, the work she's been doing the last two summers. Thank you for participating in the 2020 Virtual Veggie Research Tour. My name is Jen Zabonetskaya, and I'm a graduate student at Michigan State University. Today I'll be giving you an update on the research I've been doing throughout the past year, looking at asparagus beetles, their overwintering biology, and creating different integrated pest management strategies for their control. For today's agenda, we'll be first looking at the results of the 2020 insecticide trial. Then we'll discuss where asparagus beetles may be overwintering throughout your fields, and then what materials they particularly like to overwinter in. We'll end the video with a look into the field, showing you a little bit more about my research. At the end of the virtual field day, we'll be having a Q&A, so if you have any questions at all, I'd be happy to answer them. So we initially planned on having our 2020 insecticide trial in May during harvest. But due to the current situation, we conducted it post-harvest in early July. We mowed back the stalks to have a more of a harvest environment for the beetles. We used nine different insecticide treatments, a mix of conventional and organic, all which had a 24-hour pre-harvest interval. We released a total of 380 adult beetles, 10 beetles in each pot, and an extra 120 throughout the field. It's important to note that we didn't use enclosures in this trial, so beetles were free to go wherever. We then waited 24 hours and assessed how many beetles and the number of eggs that remained on plants. And the following were the results. I first wanted to say that this is preliminary data and the results will definitely need to be explored more. But on the left, you can see the average adult asparagus beetles that were found alive on each plant. And on the x-axis, you can see each treatment. You can see that the control which had no insecticide application, had the highest amount of beetles, which is what we'd expect. The neem oil and the permethrin had the second highest amounts of beetles, with the entrust, corrigin, and half rate of carbaryl having a significantly lower amount of beetles than the control. 
No beetles were found in the sail, full-strength carbaryl, or pygonic. It's important to mention that permethrin typically works better for asparagus beetle larvae, which may explain why it wasn't as successful for adult beetles. Additionally, the pyganic seems like it could potentially be a good option for treatment of asparagus beetles, but further exploration is needed to confirm this. Similar results were found for the number of eggs found on each asparagus stalk. The highest number of eggs were found on the control, where permethrin and neem oil were found at lower levels. In trust, corrigin, and the half rate of carbaryl were significantly lower than the control, demonstrating efficacy in these treatments. No beetles were found in the sale, full-strength carbaryl, or the pyganic. Again, these are preliminary results, and further exploration is needed. Another part of my project has involved looking at where throughout asparagus fields asparagus fields are choosing to overwinter in. In the winter of 2019, I surveyed seven asparagus fields in Oceana and Cass County. I surveyed three different areas in each asparagus field. The asparagus field itself, the weed margin, and the surrounding woodlot. I took samples from each area, such as leaf litter, old asparagus stalks, and woody debris back to the lab to search for overwintering asparagus beetles. We then assessed the beetles for survival to see if they were dead or alive. Here you can see on the y-axis that it represents the average adult beetles found per one meter squared sample, and on the x-axis you can see where these beetles were found, either in the asparagus field, weed margin, or woodlot. You can see here that most of the beetles, both alive and dead, were found within asparagus fields. No alive beetles were found within the weed margin, but some dead beetles were found there. Both alive and dead beetles were found in the woodlots, although a lot fewer than within the asparagus field. This is still preliminary data and we plan on collecting more data in the winter of 2020 to further explore this question. Another question that I've been focusing on is, what materials do beetles overwinter in? Beetles have been previously observed overwintering in a variety of substrates, such as asparagus stalks, under bark, and within leaf litter. So I decided to explore this question further by saying which substrate led to the highest beetle survival. To do this, we constructed 100 overwintering cages, as you can see here. We placed five different substrate treatments containing either thick bark, thin bark, asparagus stalks, deciduous leaves, or coniferous leaves or pine leaves. We set 50 boxes at the asparagus research farm in Hart and 50 at the entomology farm in East Lansing. Each treatment was replicated 10 times. We placed 10 adult asparagus beetles in each cage and secured it, leaving them to overwinter in the substrate. In the spring, we opened up the boxes and assessed the beetle survival of each box. The following were the results. On the y-axis, we have the average adult beetles that survived per cage, and on the x-axis, we have the five different treatments. Coniferous leaves, deciduous leaves, stalks, thick bark, and thin bark. Here we can see that survival was highest within the deciduous leaves and the stalks. With thick bark, thin bark, and coniferous leaves, having the lowest survival. There wasn't any significant results when looking at mortality, so I decided to look at the differences between beetle survival between locations. We found quite a few differences when comparing beetle survival and overwintering cages between the East Lansing and Hart locations. We found significantly higher survival in deciduous leaves and stalks in Hart in comparison to East Lansing. We find this to be a very interesting result and hope to explore this further. We also monitored average temperatures that the beetles were exposed to in each substrate and we're analyzing that as well. I wanted to give a special thanks to the members of the Sundry Lab, Ben Whirling, John Baker, the Michigan Asparagus Commission, MSU Extension, Project Green, and of course all the participating asparagus growers that let me use their fields. Thank you so much and I would be happy to answer any of your questions. My name is Jen Zavalinskaya, and today I'll be showing you a glimpse inside an asparagus field. Today I'm at an asparagus field at the Student Organic Farm at Michigan State University. Although it might be a little bit different from your asparagus field, it shares a lot of qualities. So you may be wondering what exactly I'm doing when I'm coming to your asparagus field and serving for beetles. Today I'll show you a little demonstration of some of the surveying tools I use when coming to survey your field for asparagus beetles. This asparagus field has both 
female and male plants, which can harbor both common asparagus beetles and spotted asparagus beetles. But today we'll be focusing on the common asparagus beetle. As you may know, asparagus beetles are specialist insects that will only consume asparagus as a food source. They create significant damage to asparagus throughout egg, larval, and adult stages. During harvest, beetle populations seem to appear even after repeated spraying and treatment. Our research has really been trying to answer the question of where beetles may be coming from. One of our tentative explanations is their overwintering habitat. As a result, We've been focusing on year-round monitoring of asparagus beetles with a special emphasis on their overwintering to understand more about their biology and better ways to control them. To do that, I start with monitoring their activity throughout the fall. The typical tool I use is this measuring tape. I typically measure out 25 meter transects and count all asparagus beetle eggs, larvae, and adult beetles within those 25 meters. Then I space each transect by 50 meters so I can cover a majority of your field. Here's an example of me laying out a 25 meter transect. Now I'll count all the beetles that I find along this transect. I look super close at all of the asparagus fern and stalks looking for all life stages of asparagus beetles. Then I count them on my tablet. You may be wondering how I'm covering in your entire field as some of them are really large. Well, I'm not. I'm actually usually focusing on asparagus field edges that are surrounded by woodlots. Since we know asparagus beetles tend to overwinter in these woodlots, I found it super interesting to look at the populations around those woodlots. This woodlot that surrounds me here is a good example of a woodlot you might find surrounding your asparagus field. Although this one does not have a lot of pine trees, I found a variety of different trees surrounding asparagus fields. For my winter sampling, I collected samples from asparagus fields themselves, weed margins like this, and also within woodlots. By locating these beetle hotspots throughout asparagus fields, we can try to figure out what types of landscapes, habitats, and even specific tree species may be associated with these beetle hotspots. By understanding what types of habitat beetles prefer, we can target pest management efforts more efficiently. Thank you for taking a glimpse into an asparagus field with me today. I hope you learned a little bit more about my research and asparagus beetle surveying. I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end if you have any. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Thank you, Jen, for, for sharing that. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, the Q&A box is located at the bottom of your screen, so please type them on in. Um, Jen, I wanted to ask you, how, how do you go about surveying a woodlot? That seems like hard, hard work. Yeah, so it's similar to how we do the asparagus fields. We use the same kind of tape measure and we create transects. And what I've been doing is I've been measuring um, kind of like the width around the trees and then the different species. And then this fall, I'm actually planning on also checking um, the number of dead trees versus alive trees to see if that's making any kind of an influence on beetle numbers. Since it seems like a lot of the beetles are overwintering within the trees sometimes. I thought Got that it. might be a good thing to check out. Got it. Okay, Jen, we had, um, we have a question for you. Um, were there any, so you mentioned you're measuring temperature um, on campus and then at heart, were there any noticeable um, temperature differences between the two locations or other weather differences like snowfall or snow cover? Yeah, so that's actually a really great question and something we're looking at right now. So you can see between the locations, um, heart had a lot higher of a survival, especially in, I think it was deciduous leaves. Um, and we believe we did use the data loggers to measure that, and we believe that has to do with um, there's more of a stable temperature in heart, it seems like, and it seems like when there's more drastic temperature changes, that might be putting more stress on the beetles. So we think that might be playing a big impact on um, beetle survival. 
So we think if there's a lot of variation throughout the winter, like in East Lansing, there was definitely more, I would say, um, that that's going to cause uh, a lower beetle survival compared to heart, which seems to have more of a stable, even though sometimes colder, is still a more stable temperature. I know at the research farm, um, John chops his fern in the spring. At, um, on, on campus, do they also, was that fern there all winter too? Uh, that was chopped as well. Was it, um, was the ferns around over the winter? Did they chop it in the fall? Um, it was in the fall, I believe, yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, well, very good, Jen. Um, I really appreciate your time today. Um, it looks like right now we don't have um, any more questions in the Q&A. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? Uh, not for now, but I'm looking forward to sharing more results in the future. Okay. Well, very good, Jen. Um, I appreciate your, your time with us this evening and um, I mean, we'll talk to you at the end, too. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Okay, everybody. Well, <clears throat> I guess this is one difference between a virtual field day and a live one. We're usually running about 15 minutes behind at the live one, but here we're, um, we're definitely on time, which is good. Um, so our next, our next two speakers will be um, Zach Hayden and Michael Mativa. Um, Zach is our soil fertility specialist at MSU, and Michael is, is his graduate student. And they've been taking a look at nitrogen rate and timing in both asparagus um, as well as carrots um, for the last couple years, um, seeing how we can get the most bang for our buck with nitrogen and um, get it to the plants when we need it. Um, so with that, I think we can go ahead and let's hear about um, asparagus and Zach, your work on nitrogen rate and timing. Hi, I'm Zach Hayden, the Soil and Nutrient Management Specialist for Vegetable Crops at Michigan State University. In this video, I'm going to give you an update on our asparagus nitrogen management research. This is a project we've been working on for three years now in collaboration with Omen Brothers Farm and with funding support from Michigan Asparagus, MDARD, and the USDA. Asparagus production systems have changed a lot over the past few decades, with new higher yielding varieties, increased fresh market production, and expanded use of overhead irrigation, there's been greater interest in more intensive fertility management programs for asparagus. In particular, many growers have wondered if higher rates of nitrogen fertilizer, as well as split applications during fern growth, may be necessary to optimize yield and quality for modern production systems, particularly on West Michigan's sandy soils. So, in 2017, we started an on-farm experiment and established three-year-old stand of millennium under center pivot irrigation. Each year, our treatments included four rates of nitrogen fertilizer applied as urea post-harvest, 50, 80, 110, and 140 pounds nitrogen per acre. For reference, 80 pounds is the current maximum MSU nitrogen recommendation for established stands. In addition, we also tested two split treatments where a portion of the total nitrogen was applied later during fern growth. These split treatments went on in late July with the goal of promoting fern productivity. But just like with irrigation, it's important not to apply nitrogen too late to avoid stimulating parasitic growth or delaying senescence. To track the effects of our nitrogen treatments, we collected data on stem counts, fern biomass, and fern nutrient content over the course of the summer from shutdown to fern senescence. We also tracked what was happening with soil inorganic nitrogen, both in the top 12 inches during the summer and to one meter depth in the fall. Of course, getting good yield data from a commercial field with picking crews going through sometimes twice a day was a challenge, so we had to get creative. To get information on yield, each week during the harvest season, we would cut and collect the stubble of all spears harvested over the prior week and take them back to the lab, where we'd then count them and use software to measure diameters from imagery. This gave us data on the total number and average diameter of all spears harvested each year, which we could then use to evaluate any potential effects the nitrogen treatments may have on yield. 
We also took one actual harvest of spears each week to evaluate possible effects on spear quality and nitrogen content. So, after three years, what have we found? Well, not many differences. This graph shows total number of spears produced across our N-rate and split application treatments over three harvest seasons. We've seen no differences in any year so far, whether we applied 50 to 140 pounds of nitrogen or whether we applied some end during fern growth or not. This same story was true for the average diameter of spears, which suggests little potential impact of our nitrogen treatments on yield. Interestingly, we've also found very few relevant differences in fern growth characteristics or in fern and spear nitrogen content, despite seeing very effective scavenging of fertilizer end from the soil profile. This suggests the asparagus may just be storing excess N in the root system, and we're in the process of analyzing root samples collected this spring to take a closer look at this. Taken together, we've found very little evidence that higher than currently recommended nitrogen rates or splitting N applications during fern growth are beneficial, or in other words, are likely to provide an economic return. Now, while this is only one relatively short-term study, our results are in good company, with a number of past experiments in Michigan also showing lack of response to higher than recommended nitrogen rates or split applications. It's also worth noting that there's a body of evidence suggesting that particularly higher rates of nitrogen can lead to increased risks of spear quality issues. To understand why established stands of asparagus may not be particularly responsive to more intensive nitrogen management, it helps to look a little deeper. Even accounting for possible variation among cultivars, established asparagus plants have a massive root system for effectively scavenging nutrients and water from the soil profile, and for storing carbohydrates and nutrients that fuel spear growth. And as the root system gets larger with age, its reserves of nitrogen grow as well, with a typical established asparagus root system containing even much more than 280 pounds of nitrogen per acre. This is important because the majority of the nitrogen in spears actually comes directly from the nitrogen stored in the crown, and even high yields require a relatively small proportion of the nitrogen in the gas tank each year. While nitrogen is of course also needed to produce healthy fern in the field, it's still only a portion of potential root storage, and up to 90% of that nitrogen in the fern is remobilized back to the root system when the fern senesces. So what's the key take home? The most critical time for nutrient management in asparagus is at establishment, when the crown or root system is still small. In that establishment year, MSU nitrogen recommendations are higher, up to 100 pounds of nitrogen, preferably split 50 pounds in the furrow and then another 50 pounds when the fern gets to be about 6 inches tall. But if for established stands, which were the focus of this study, lower annual nitrogen fertilizer rates are enough. We've seen no evidence that applying more than the MSU recommended 50 to 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year or splitting applications during fern growth is likely to provide an economic return. Thanks for listening, and if you're interested, you can hear more about this project at the virtual Great Lakes Expo this year in December. Take care. Hello, I'm Michael Mativa, a master's student in the Hayden Lab. Today I'll be giving an update on a processing carrot trial that we're running in collaboration with Omen Brothers Farms with funding from the Michigan Carrot Committee and the USDA SARE program. This is the second and final year of this trial, which is testing the effects of nitrogen top dress rate and timing on carrot yield and shoot biomass. We've also integrated a remote sensing element in the form of drone imagery. Uh, my thesis is about using drones in vegetable production, and in this trial we're testing the imagery's viability as a decision-making tool for top dress nitrogen applications. I'll be talking a bit more about that aspect later on, but first we'll go over why we ran this experiment. So nitrogen management in processing carrots is trickier than in some other crops. They're typically grown in sandy soils, so applying the entire season's worth of N at planting risks much of it being leached away before the plants can actually use it. Processing carrots can also be in the ground for six months or more, so split top dress applications are often used to ensure a steady supply of nitrogen throughout the season. When to apply those top dresses and how much fertilizer is needed are less certain, and those are the main questions that this experiment is trying to answer. Last year's harvest gave us some interesting insights. You can see a general upward trend in yield as N rate increases, although only the highest N rate showed a significant yield increase from using only starter nitrogen. 
So far this year, we haven't seen any significant differences in the weight of the carrots based on the end rate. You can see the average fresh weights of the carrots are all increasing similarly over time, but as they grow through September, some treatments might start to run out of gas. Here we have last year's harvest data comparing front-loaded top dressing where we applied all at once in early July versus three split applications about four weeks apart. We actually found no yield differences between the front-loaded and split top dressing strategies, and that same result is developing again this year with the carrots growing at about the same rate. As of August 26th, we still hadn't seen any significant differences between the two strategies. The last yield comparison we made in 2019 was between top dress timings, where we shifted the split application schedule two weeks earlier or later. We saw no significant yield differences, so for our trial it didn't actually matter when top dresses started within that four week window. Once again, this year we're seeing a similar pattern where all the carrots are growing at similar rates, and as of August 26th, there were no significant differences in the average carrot weights. It's important to remember that we only pull five carrots per plot every time we visit to monitor their growth, so there's a lot of variability, and as I said, there's still a good amount of time left for differences to show up. We'll have a clearer picture of any differences when we harvest larger sections at the end of the season. The second part of this trial is looking at drone imagery as a tool for top dress decision making. As of now, petiole nitrate testing often fills that role, where a top dress is triggered if the nitrate levels fall below a certain threshold. We sample petioles in this trial every two weeks, but we also fly the drone to monitor the growth and health of the carrots. This could be a faster way to gather data to make top dressing decisions. Flying the drone also allows sampling from the entire field rather than sampling petioles in just a few places. The first step to getting this data is to take images of the field using a drone, in this case a Phantom 4 Pro. These images are brought into this program, PIX4D. Uh, each of these red dots represents one of the images taken by the drone, and you can see that it flew in a grid pattern to get good coverage of the entire field. PIX4D takes all of those overlapping images and matches them up to create one image of the entire field, complete with height and location information for each pixel. This gives us this 3D rendering of the field to analyze. Now we can use geographic software to define where our plots are, like this, and extract data about the size and color of the plants in each plot by calculating vegetation indices. For example, this is a common index called NDVI. The plants in these lighter, fuller areas are larger and greener on average than those in these darker, more sparse areas. In 2019, we used the NDVI values of the high-end front-loaded treatment to calculate a threshold for top dressing similar to the petiole nitrate threshold. For context, this is the petiole nitrate concentration for the treatment with no top dress N. The concentration quickly falls below the black line, which is the minimum threshold for triggering a top dress, and as it never gets a top dress, it stays low. This is the NDVI tracking for the same treatment with a very similar pattern. It's consistently below the threshold, meaning it should get a top dress, but again, it never does. For comparison, here's the petiole nitrate concentration for the treatment with three top dresses at the recommended end rate. You can see a few spikes after we top dress, but it tends to stay below the line. The NDVI tracking shows the treatment following the recommendation line a little bit better, always staying pretty close and ending up in a good position towards the end of the season. This is just one possible method for using drone imagery similar to how you might use petiole nitrate sampling. We applied on a set schedule for this trial, but in the future it would be interesting to see a trial where the imagery was actually used to decide when to top dress. This trial will be ending with the upcoming carrot harvest, and the data from that harvest will shed more light on how much these different top dress strategies impact yield. That concludes my update on this trial. I hope you found it interesting, and thanks for watching. All right, everybody. Um, Zach and Michael, if you don't mind, if you could um, unmute yourselves and, and turn on your video. Um, great, great job, guys. It was really interesting. Um, um, Zach, one, one question that, um, that was sparked by your presentation was, um, where, where, do, where does the fern derive most of its nitrogen from? You mentioned that spears during harvest get most of it from the crown. Is that the same for fern or, or is it deriving a greater percentage from our um, lay-by applications? Uh, yeah. yeah, fern is actually, it's a more of a mixture. So the spears early on in the season before the crown has really woken up as much uh, to take up nitrogen. Uh, those are largely taking nitrogen directly from the crown, what's stored there, and actually really close to the buds where the spears are coming from. Um, 
the fern at that point, the reserves in the crown have gone down quite a bit from all the spear harvest. Uh, now you're getting more uptake from the soil into the root system again. So there's still going to be quite a bit of nitrogen that's uh, coming from what's still stored in the root system, but also uh, more that has been taken up in that the course of that harvest season getting into that fern. Um, and it looks like we had um, another question um, that just popped into the box. Thank you, Zach. That was helpful. Um, and I think this is for both, yeah, both you and Michael. Um, and because it, it looks like it's about carrots. So um, the question was, did nitrogen rate, so it did affect yield, but did it affect top quality? And I think that question comes from, um, in case our listeners don't know, our carrots are mechanically harvested. So we need good tops to pull them out of the soil. If they snap, we carrot might as well not be there. So did it affect top quality? Uh, yes, it certainly did. Um, so you could see from the imagery fairly well in like the NDVI example that I showed. Um, we saw last year and are seeing this year quite a, a big difference, I think, in uh, the top quality. Uh, the problem, the reason I didn't talk about it too much, um, is basically that we don't have a good model for like how uh, the like amount of biomass that we have correlated to top strength. Um, at, or like yield loss from the tops breaking. Um, so we definitely did see significant differences in uh, the amount of shoot biomass among all of the different treatments. It pretty much ran as you would expect where the higher nitrogen rates gave you better quality tops. Um, but yeah, we don't have a solid, uh, we don't have solid numbers for how that might affect the actual mechanical harvest. Yeah, that's a great question. And we've been working on that, uh, not just in this trial, but in a number of trials um, going back many years. And, and Michael summarized it great. I mean, of course, when you apply more nitrogen, we're going to get bigger, healthier tops. Uh, but where that cutoff is, at what point does it become a problem when your tops are, uh, you know, either not big enough or, or too big? It's, it's hard. We've, we've tried, but it's hard to figure out exactly where that is. I will say, uh, across most of our treatments, I'd, I'm almost sometimes more concerned when we get to the higher nitrogen rates, even though we have a yield response, that the tops can get so big that, you know, there's even potential for them to get tangled in uh, more than, you know, it's only the lowest rates where we sometimes see tops looking like, oh, this would be a problem uh, for getting them out of the ground. Gotcha. Okay, um, another question that came up. I know um, in the past there's been correlation between um, nitrogen fertility and alternaria or other foliar blights. Is that something that you guys have seen in your trials? Um, I can't say that we have. We weren't looking specifically for that, um, but we also didn't really see it. Um, so yeah, we. It might have just been, you know, the field that we were in, um, but we didn't see any uh, noticeable effects. Yeah, not in this trial. Um, we have looked at that in other trials as well, a little bit more closely, and and of course, well established if the that if the plants are stressed, you have really low nitrogen content, that there's sometimes more susceptibility uh, to disease. Uh, but in reality, uh, so for the trials I've been involved in. Uh, we usually don't within like a, you know, kind of a normal range of recommended nitrogen rates. Uh, we don't see as strong a response uh, once you get above, you know, enough nitrogen for the plants to grow decently. We start seeing that relationship with uh, disease drop off a little bit more. Gotcha. Um, okay, guys, we had another question. Um, what does it take to get started with a drone and software um, to make top dress decisions in mid-season? And kind of the related question is, are there companies available to help farms? So I think it, you know, it's the, we saw some really cool images. We saw Michael who really knows how to use them. I think the question comes from, as a grower, what, I mean, is this technology I can pick up somewhere and use? Yeah, um, 
So I would say, well, first of all, there are uh, definitely companies that are cropping up um, to handle like the sort of image processing and data analysis and deliver recommendations. Um, I don't know, just from what I've seen, which admittedly is limited, but from what I've seen, I think a lot of them promise a lot of things that aren't necessarily proven. Um, so like in, uh, in terms of, you know, farmers themselves getting started, I think that might be, uh, it's a, there are the very entry level ways, I guess, of getting into it. Um, drones, you know, entry level professional grade drones might cost on the order of like one to, or one, uh, to around $2,000 maybe. Um, so it definitely is an investment, uh, but, you know, using it for something as simple as just scouting and getting an idea of what you can see from the air can be nice. There are some simple things that you could do uh, that would be relatively easy to pick up uh, to maybe detect areas where, um, you know, the foliage is a little bit uh, more sparse or damaged in some way. Um, in terms of software, there are some that cost, and again, a good amount of money, uh, a few thousand dollars maybe to uh, stitch all of those images together. The program Pix4D that we use, um, I think costs on the order of maybe two to $3,000 for like a perpetual license. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a pretty high barrier to entry, I think, uh, for some of the more complicated, uh, some of the more complicated analyses, I guess, or the more complicated use cases. Uh, but just getting started uh, with taking a couple images, bringing them back and looking at, you know, how the field looks or even running simple, uh, you know, image analysis techniques that can be done with some free software. Uh, and if you want, I guess, more specific instructions or recommendations, I can give those, uh, maybe email me after this or something. Um, but yeah, there are, it, it really depends on the level that you want to get into. Um, but it is, there is a higher barrier to entry, I think, than a lot of people might expect. Yeah, that's, that's a great answer, uh, Michael. And I, I just add that uh, if you are, you need to be pretty technically inclined, uh, especially on the software and computing side, to be able to just pick up and do what Michael's doing. And even then, it takes a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, so in terms of actually making nitrogen management decisions based on the imagery, and so this is really kind of in the research stages right now while, while we're making that investment to see if it's worth it and what the, the pros and cons are and challenges. Um, ultimately, few farmers are probably going to have the time to do all of this themselves, but if it's a significant improvement over the status quo, uh, petiole nitrate sampling, for example, then we'd expect that in the future as the price of these technologies come down and the service services out there doing it go up, uh, that this would be uh, a much more realistic thing to do. Uh, but as Michael pointed out, uh, anybody who's interested in, in lots of people, lots of farmers already have them, just getting a drone to uh, go up and scout a field really quick, don't underestimate the value of that. I've been uh, really surprised by some of the things I learned just from that perspective, just from a, a picture from above. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I know what you guys mean. Sometimes I, um, as an extension educator, we look at a lot of, I guess, fields that have unidentified challenges and you, you wonder if you could see a pattern from above that you can't see mm -hmm. by, by walking in the field. Um, well, thanks guys. Um, I had another question for you. I was wondering how, how well correlated were those PDL nitrate samples with the NDVI? Were they pretty well related or are they giving different types of information? Um, well, they're definitely giving different types of information in terms of like purely what. Yes, you're right. Uh, <laughs> but so NDVI, um, if I am recalling correctly, I don't think it was particularly well correlated with the petiole nitrate uh, sampling. We had 
a lot of noise, like a, uh, in the petiole nitrate sampling, a lot of variability, even within treatments, even within like individual plots. Um, so yeah, it, there was, there was a lot of noise for one. And then, yeah, they're, they're kind of measuring two different things. Um, you could theoretically use both to get at the question of, you know, should I top dress, but they are, they are fundamentally just measures of two different things. And so I think that's a big part of why we didn't really see strong correlations between those two things directly. Yeah, but if you're thinking about the answer that they're giving you to, do I top dress or do I not? Uh, we see a stronger association between the, the two methods. So um, mm -hmm. I think yep. what, what Michael was saying too is, yeah, you're NDVI, you're looking at the tops of the plants root nitrates you're, or uh, petiole nitrate, you're directly measuring the, the nitrate content in a certain part of the shoots. And uh, we developed two different kind of uh, metrics uh, based on that information. But I would say kind of as Michael uh, pointed out that the uh, variation, the variability uh, in the NDVI, so the drone imagery answers or index is a little bit more consistent. It makes sense a little bit more of the time. And uh, there are some definite advantages uh, in terms of labor requirements uh, when it comes to, you know, it's a lot of time out there pulling petiole samples. And uh, anybody who's done that, I know a lot of the farmers um, have kept up with that. We do it in the lab. Uh, the nitrate meters <laughs> that are used are not always the most accurate and uh, can be frustrating to work with. And sometimes I question the uh, numbers that are coming out of them if they haven't been maintained uh, really closely. Gotcha. <clears throat> well, um, well, thank you guys. I, I had one last question and I think I, um, we will we'll move on, but um, I wanted to ask you, so part of the reason you guys are doing this work is to look at um, minimizing nitrates in the roots. Um, as a potential processing issue. And I wondered if you found any difference in root nitrates between fertility treatments. Maybe that's not something you're looking at in this trial. No, oh, yeah, we actually, um, we looked at that last year and we're planning on looking at it again this year. Um, so last year we tested the root nitrate levels in about the last month, I think, leading up to harvest. And I believe this year we're only gonna do it at harvest. Um, but mainly because last year across that entire month, we basically saw no, um, nothing even approaching like the, the uh, legal cutoff. Um, yeah, it's, it, it was either like undetectable or very low uh, based on the, like the equipment we were using. Um, so yeah, I, it, it was not a concern at any of the nitrogen levels that we were testing. Uh, so yeah, I think most, in most cases, you should be pretty safe from that. And we found that in a number of trials. I mean, there's, I won't go into a lot, but there's a few key issues that are impacting uh, root nitrates. And rate is obviously one of them, but perhaps even more important is the timing of when the nitrogen went on, uh, how far ahead of harvest. Because you apply the nitrogen, it's going to spike, the nitrate levels in the root are going to spike, and then gradually... Uh, it'll be metabolized by the plant over time. And we've seen that even relatively high top dress amounts uh, will kind of disappear to negligible levels in the roots over the course of four, four weeks or so. And so in the latest trial, we haven't been testing top dresses that are particularly close to harvest. Uh, all of ours finish up in, in September and then we'll be harvesting uh, earlier to mid October. So we haven't, haven't seen a whole lot of issues with nitrates. Gotcha. Well, thanks, guys. Um, I know I really enjoyed it. Um, thanks for your time, time this evening. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, everybody. So um, we've been mostly talking above ground. Um, now we're going to move underground. We're going to um, hear about work by um, Dr. Marisol Quintanilla Tornell's lab. Um, she's our MSU Applied Nematologist in um, work that's been done by her graduate student, Ellie Darling, who's been looking at um Hello, 
my name is Marisol Quintanella and I'm the nematologist from Michigan State University. Our lab works with plant parasitic nematodes that affect multiple crops here in Michigan. One of them is carrots, but we also work in parsnips and multiple other vegetables, fruits, ornamentals, field crops such as soybean, corn, sugar beets, and ornamentals such as daily leaves. We have a great team working with us, and they will be giving you more details about um, plant parasitic nematodes and carrots. But our team includes Emily Cole, and Emily Cole is my most wonderful lab manager. Um, Sita, and she works with cover crops, and she's been an excellent postdoc. And Elizabeth, doing her PhD in carrots. And I could tell you sincerely, she really loves nematodes. Um, so, what are plant parasitic nematodes? Plant parasitic nematodes are microscopic round worms that feed mostly in the roots of plants. There are some plant parasitic nematodes that feed in other plant parts, but the ones that we mostly work in our lab are the ones that feed in roots or stems of plants. In carrots, this can be devastating because you are actually harvesting part of the root system. And if it is split or forked, it becomes unmarketable. Root knot nematode is such a serious problem in carrots that multiple um, farmers have been kicked out of their fields, mainly muck fields, because of root knot nematode problems. When a field has high root knot nematode numbers, producing carrots and many other root crops in that field becomes virtually impossible, um, and it needs to be managed, mainly with rotations of non hosts That's one of the best ways. Well, root lesion nematode is the the, I would say the largest nematode problem in Michigan in mineral soils such as sandy, um, sandy soils or pretty much any mineral soil in Michigan. And root lesion nematode also produces forking and also produces other, other problems such as lesion and can make the plant more susceptible to other diseases. And um, Elizabeth it has gotten really into this and we have found that there's more than one species in these carrot fields, and she has um, discovered this with molecular techniques, and she will be giving us more details about that. Hi everybody, I'm Elizabeth Darling, and here I'm pulling a carrot that has been impacted by root lesion nematode. As you're probably well aware, root lesion nematode is one of the most devastating plant parasitic nematodes in the world. It comes in number three, right after root knot and cyst nematode. This is an example of a carrot highly infested with root knot nematode and carrot cyst nematode. While carrot cyst is not that common in Michigan, root knot nematode is, and both of them can be extremely damaging. Our current research focuses on root lesion nematode, which results in unmarketable characteristics such as these. Typically, we refer to these unmarketable characteristics as forking, but they can also result in stubbiness, forking stubbiness, and occasionally hairiness. In addition, root lesion nematode feeding can produce lesions, which can introduce other pathogens in the soil. Last year, Dr. Sita Tapa and I discovered that in the soil samples, there are actually a really low amount of root lesion nematode males. Now, this is important because the species that we had previously associated most of the yield loss with in Michigan was Pratolinchus penetrans, which has a 50-50 male-female ratio. This caused us to be aware of the potential that maybe there could be more than one root lesion nematode species in the field. After we discovered this concern, 
we picked out individual nematodes and submitted them to Dr. Henry Chung. They used molecular techniques in their lab to determine that more than one species was present. Two root lesion nematode species, Pratolinchus penetrans and Pratolinchus neglectus. These nematodes look so similar that even trained nematologists could not determine the difference between the two. Now, this is significant because in literature, there is a giant lack of information on the second species of nematode called Pratolinchus neglectus. This in the Pacific Northwest is actually a really damaging nematode that can result in large crop loss for wheat. Because of this reason, we were concerned that interceding with wheat could potentially be building the densities of this nematode during the most critical part of carrot growth. However, to investigate this, we first need to determine how impactful Pratolinchus neglectus is on carrot. If it's the same as Pratolinchus penetrans, thresholds may resume the same. However, there may be alternative recommendations for interceding. In order to investigate this, we currently have two ongoing greenhouse trials established. One of them is to first determine how impactful Pratolinchus neglectus and Pratolinchus penetrans are on both carrot and wheat seedlings. For this reason, we're growing carrots uninoculated, carrots with Pratolinchus penetrans added, and carrots with Pratolinchus neglectus added. We're also doing the same for wheat, so we can monitor how the population levels change in 60 days. We'll be able to determine at the end how many tap roots were formed for the carrots and what population levels the wheat are. Knowing this information will give us a lot more answers and less questions, hopefully, about what's going on in the first 30 to 60 days of growth for carrot seedlings. We believe this is the most important part of carrot growth still and reducing the impact of multiple taproot formation. Our second greenhouse trial is focused on the different densities in the first 60 days of growth of Pratolinchus penetrans and Pratolinchus neglectus on carrot. We are using a high, medium, and low density that are all above threshold range to determine how impacted carrots are at this current recommendation. This study aims to determine if high density Pratolinchus neglectus carrots produce the same number of unmarkable characteristics as Pratolinchus penetrans, high, medium, and low densities in comparison to an untreated control. Last but not least, our field trial is still going strong. Though we have not harvested yet, we have collected data from soil samples up to mid-season. Most importantly, from initial to 30 days, six products showed reduction significantly for root lesion nematode. These products include Majestine, TerraStart, Promax, another product from Maroon, and Vellum. In addition, compost has also shown statistically significant reduction. However, before we can recommend these products, we need to determine their impact on yield and if they reduced unmarketable characteristic production. We won't know that until probably mid-October, so stay tuned to find out the results from all of our trials, hopefully at Glexpo this year. And now an update from Dr. Sita Tapa on her research in cover crops. My name is Sita Tapa and I'm a research associate in Marisol Quintanilla's lab in Michigan State University. 
Uh, most of the project I'm working on is about on cover crops. So we are using cover crops or we are evaluating different cover, cover crops for the new method management in several crops like the soybean, carols, and other other. So a few new methods we are working to manage are root net new method, root lesion new method, and soybean cyst new method. For root lesion new method and root net new method in uh, in chaos, we we evaluated several cover crops. Most of them are radishes, and so far we have we have finished like post evaluation of different radishes and. Uh, some grasses for root nut, and we found that um, some radish cultivars like uh, Control, Concord, Nitro, Select are really poor hosts for uh, root lesion nematode. And for the root nut nematode, like several grasses like Jupiter wheat, Sudan grass, and oat, plus few radishes like uh, Control and Concord are poor host uh, for this, uh, for both like root lesion nematode and root nut nematode. We, we are planning to evaluate this, uh, all the screen cultivars we have so far in greenhouse condition and see if they really help in nematode management too. Uh, we will know more from the greenhouse study then following year we are planning to do field trial where we will learn more about the all the cover crops we have evaluated if they really control these nematodes or not in carrot field. In addition, we also have a field trial on parsnips on growing. And Emily Cole is going to talk a little bit about our research updates for that. So this year we also have trials working in parsnips, which are also negatively affected by nematodes, particularly root nut nematodes and root lesion nematodes. Um, and what they do is they basically make the parsnip unmarketable by causing hairiness or galling, um, all the things that you don't really want on a parsnip. Um, and so for this year, the, our trial is carrying over some products that we tested last year, including vellum, nimitz, and magistine. And then we're also trying a few new things. Um, we're trying melicon, which is a biocontrol agent. Um, the fungus is Propriocilium malacnum. And then we're also testing some compost provided by Morgan Composting, um, both the LAB, which is just a mixture of dairy manure and poultry manure. And then we're also just testing poultry manure by itself. And then there's also one more product from Maroon Bio Innovations. We're also comparing all of these products to the grower standard, which is Bite 8, um, which is just applied at the beginning of the season. Um, and actually, what's really exciting so far is that the product Nimitz, which we're testing again this year, showed really similar reductions in unmarketable characteristics to the Bite 8. So that looks promising, and we're hoping to see similar results this year to provide growers with an alternative to Bite 8. All right, Ellie, um, thanks for, for putting that together for us. Yeah, of course. Good to be here today. Yeah, thanks for being with us. Um, I, I had a question. I know that growers have been fairly interested in layer ash blend. Um, what, what have you guys seen so far in car carrots and, and parsnips with layer ash blend? So um, we just added um, the layer ash this year to our parsnip trial. Um, so we're unsure about its impact on root knot. Um, however, we have been historically including um, layer ash in our um, previous carrot trials. Um, we have found that it increases um, marketable yield, although we haven't found it significantly. Um, but we're hoping that this year um, we can find um, significant increase of like grade one carrots. So for some products. <laughs> okay, good. Um, are, among the nematicides you tested in carrots, are there any that seem to be working consistently? 
Um, so every year, Majestine actually has popped up as, um, it hasn't been significant, but it's always been right there with um, reducing unmarkable characters. Um, so next, after 2020, um, so, so far the field trial this year has been the most promising just because um, we were actually able to get a field this year, which was awesome. Thank you, Ralph Ullman. Um, for providing us with a field just historically. And uh, this year, awesomely, um, the root lesion populations were close to threshold. So we were able to see um, significant reduction in nematode numbers um, for the five products. Um, so we'll have to see if that continues um, on to harvest and if, that redu if those five products reduced um, uh, the production of working. Good. Well, thank you, Guy. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Um, there's a question in the Q&A box. Um, and the question is, have you done any testing with soil fumigants for nematode control? We have not. Um, I believe a lot of fumigants have been removed. Um, I think biofumigants still are kind of like shifting. I think Marisol would probably know more about that than I would, but I know that we aren't currently working on that. Okay. Thank you, Ellie. Um, let me see. I was going to ask you, see if we got any other questions for you. Um, really appreciate the work you're doing. One of the things you mentioned a couple of times is our grower collaborators and that's that's usually what makes the in, one of the things that makes the in-person part of the field day fun is it kind of showcases how much they help you guys out and they're helping you hopefully help the industry going forward. So um, you mentioned Omen Brothers and Walingas and um, those folks put in a lot of t time to um, just like you guys do. And John with the Michigan Church. Yes. We so yeah. appreciate everything you do, and um, we're really happy to work with all of you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ellie. I enjoyed it. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Um, we're now going to move um, back above ground and we're going to add something else to our um, vegetable bowl. Um, I think now we're going to talk about onions. Um, so last couple of years, um, Dr. Hausbeck has had some really good trials on stemphylium, which is a big problem in onions um, that have showcased some helpful products. And this year, I think they're um, trying to figure out how to best use those. So. Let's get started and let's learn about um, disease control and vegetables and what's been going on this year. Hi, my name is Doug Higgins and I'm a graduate research assistant in Dr. Mary Hospick's lab at Michigan State University. I'm a PhD candidate uh, working on my degree in plant pathology. The major foliar diseases in Michigan onion production have historically included purple blotch and botrytis leaf blight. Now downy mildew can be a problem from year to year, but really with the right fungicide program, this disease can be well managed. A few years back, um, there were some, a new set of foliar symptoms showing up on the onions that kind of included these diamond shaped tan lesions. You know, at the time, uh, people weren't really sure what was causing the, these symptoms and and the Hossbag lab actually worked to figure out and link these symptoms to a pathogen called Colotoctricum coides. And then they also proceeded to do some fungicide efficacy work uh, that's really the basis for our management program that keeps this disease at bay. And so bacteria leaf blight is a major problem for onion growers in Michigan. It's a major foliar disease issue. And it continues to be a major issue. Uh, it's caused by Pantonia agglomerans. Uh, symptoms of this disease include these tan, you know, kind of necrotic lesions that run down the onion leaf. They have these water-soaked areas throughout the symptomatic tissue and kind of where the leaf connects to the bulb. The thing about bacterial leaf blight is that it's vectored by thrips. And so really management of, of this disease 
uh, is really done by keeping um, and managing thrip populations in the field. Now, the other major foliar disease that Michigan onion growers contend with is stemphilium leaf blight. And that's what I'd like to talk with you about today. Now, stemphilium leaf blight, similar to bacteria leaf blight, causes this kind of premature senescence or early dying of the onion leaves. And, you know, growers will tell you that, uh, that these onions are dying with their boots on. And, you know, and that means that they're dying, uh, they're not lodging um, as they're supposed to, they're not reaching their full development. And they're also losing green tissue you know, our photosynthetic area, you know, they're losing that early. And so what that results in is the reduced bulb uh, yield, you know, and maybe even reduced bulb sizes. Okay, so symptoms of stemphelium include uh, oval tan lesions. They start out as oval tan lesions, and then they really progress as this lesion that kind of runs down uh, the leaf of the onion. If we were to look at this under the microscope and zoom in, we would see um, a bunch of spores just covering the stark surface here uh, on these onions. Um, you know, this disease can cause some tip burn back um, and it really kind of just runs down um, from there. So today what I'd like to do is share with you some of the research we've been doing on stemphelium. Last year we started working on some efficacy trials uh, for different fungicides. Um, and this year we've really taken some of that efficacy work and expanded on it. Um, uh, and, 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 and looked at some questions that involved um, when to time the, the fungicide applications, when to initiate a fungicide application, and how often uh, to spray the fungicides. So let's go take a look at the field plots and I'll show you what we've been working on. Okay, so here we are at one of the replicates of our fungicide initiation experiment. Um, both of the experiments that we're going to look at today were done with our grower cooperator. Um, so using commercial standard production practices. Um, these are all done with a storage onion, uh, Bradley. Um, and so uh, this treatment that we're standing in front of, I picked out a, a single rep out of, um, out of the experiment to, show, to share with you today. Uh, we have several treatments in this experiment um, and they all involve on when to start the fungicide application. Uh, so what we did was we started fungicide application programs based on different growth stages of the onion. So when the onion was at three to four leaf, we started uh, a set of fungicide applications when it was at five to seven, uh, eight to 12, and then two different bulb stages. Um, and then after our fungicide program was initiated, we continued that program on a seven day application schedule. In this experiment, we tested two different fungicide programs. The first program consisted of alternations of Luna Tranquility alternated with Tilt plus Bravo Weather Stick, alternated with Omega, alternated with Moravis Prime, alternated with Aprovia Top. In the second pro program, uh, we applied Bravo Weather Stick alone, alternated with Tilt applied alone, alternated with Luna Tranquility, alternated with Miravis Prime. Okay, so the first place we'll start is in the untreated control. Um, this is the treatment that this is treatment that received no fungicide protection. Um, and as we look at these onions, you know, as the growers would say to me, they died with their boots on. Uh, so they died, what they mean is that they died standing up. Uh, they didn't end up lodging. Uh, we can see at this point um, of the season, most of the green tissue um, ha is co almost completely gone. Um, and really, you know, um, this disease is, uh, you know, has taken over this plot. Okay, so here we are in front of the, um, the program one that was applied at our earliest leaf, our earliest growth stage, which was a three to four leaf stage. Um, and this plot, um, as you can see, is that the foliage is still pretty green. Some of the onions are starting to lodge or fall over in contrast to the untreated that we just saw. Um, and then right next door, we also have program one applied at the five to seven leaf stage. Now this is about two weeks later um, and it's pretty comparable in terms of uh, percent green area of these onions. Um, and so uh, the differences between these two treatments, uh, we'll have to see how they shake out statistically, but they're gonna be pretty close. Now 
Now this treatment here is our second program. Remember we tested two different programs. Um, this is the second program that was started at the five to seven leaf stage. Um, and it, it, it does not look that different. Um, uh, it does not look different from the, uh, th from the program one. So program one and two in this trial are performing very similar um, to each other. So here we are, um, program one applied at our next growth stage, eight to 12 leaves. Um, we saw, see a noticeable difference in the percent green tissue in this plot compared to our two other earlier treatments. So here's uh, bulb stage 2.5 to 4 centimeters. So fungicides initiated when the bulbs measure 2.5 to 4 centimeters um, in diameter. And so uh, this stage, we still have some green left in this plot. Um, it's, it's fairly comparable to our 8 to 12 uh, stage treatment. Okay, this treatment here is the 4 to 7 centimeter bulb treatment, meaning that the fungicide initiation sprays started when the bulbs were 4 to 7 centimeters in size. Um, and you could, we could see, uh, based on the amount of green foliage that's left in this plot, um, that, that this might be too late to start your fungicide applications. Uh, now we still have yield data to go through, but in terms of we look at the percent green tissue left on these plants, they definitely um, lost their tissue earlier than our earlier fungicide treatments uh, that started at the three to four or five to seven leaf stage. We see that these onions, you know, again, are dying with their boots on, so they're dying standing up uh, and they haven't mod. Okay, so here we are in, the, in one of the replicates of our second experiment. Um, now in this experiment, what we wanted to look at was how often we should apply the fungicides. Uh, so some of the tr treatments that we tested were a seven day application interval, a 10 day application interval, a 14 day application interval. Um, and then we used a disease prediction uh, tool called TomCast, uh, which was developed for Alternaria on tomatoes. And we set a threshold of 15 disease severity value and 20 disease severity value, or DSV. Um, and so when uh, the, the forecasting system hit this uh, threshold level, that indicated that we should spray. So we waited until that, until, until that happened. So what I'm standing in front of right here, this is the untreated control plot. Um, pretty similar as what we saw in the previous experiment. Um, we don't have a lot of green tissue left here. Uh, none of these onions lodged over. Um, and so this was the untreated control for this experiment. Okay, so this is the seven day application interval. So fun, uh, fungicide programs, we tested again, two fungicide programs as I described earlier. Uh, both of the fungicide programs uh, were, were fairly comparable to each other. Um, and so we're looking at right here in front of us, just the program one. Um, in terms of comparable, I mean comparable in terms of level of, of disease control and percent green tissue left. Um, in this treatment here at the seven day interval, uh, we see that these onions are lodging um, and they still maintaining some green tissue um, and really looking how we'd like to see uh, our onions look at this time of year, starting to tip over um, while still remaining green um, and not die out. So let's go take a look at the 10 day application interval. Okay, so this is uh, fungus that's applied at 10 day intervals. Um, there's a little less green tissue in this plot compared to the seven day interval. Um, let's see how that works out on the statistical end, um, but, uh, and also in terms of yield size, but a little less green tissue in the 10 day, but not by much compared to the seven, almost uh, pretty close to the seven and the 10 day application intervals. Let's take a look at the 14 day application interval next. Okay, here's the 14 day application interval. Um, significantly less disease, I mean green tissue left in this plot compared to the 10 and the seven day interval. So 14 is stretching the, the application too thin. Uh, we need to be applying um, at, you know, at the seven to 10 day range um, here. And 14 is, is too long between application intervals, at least to protect the amount of green tissue that should be left at this point of the season. Um, 
But so let's take a look at, at how our disease severity, our disease prediction system worked out. Okay, so here we're in front of the 15 DSVs uh, uh, spray timing. So when our TomCast model hit 15 disease severity values, we, we would initiate a spray. Now, as you can see from, from this plot and next to me at the 20 DSV, uh, was that the fungicide prediction timing doesn't appear to be working very well. Um, there's not a lot of green tissue left in either one of these plots uh, at this point. Uh, one of the things uh, that appeared to happen was that uh, we didn't get a lot of rain this season and when we did get moisture it occurred overnight as dew. Um, but it also um, occurred with some pretty average, some pretty, the model averaged some pretty low temperatures overnight and it failed to set to accumulate high s disease severity values. Um, so we didn't get very many sprays initiated uh, for either one of these plots and as a result we can see that we lost a lot of green tissue in these plots um, and, and when we waited long application interval timing intervals between fungicide applications. So as kind of a preliminary summary of what we're seeing out here in the field now, I'm just going to preference this summary with that, you know, I'm showing you the, these field plots, you know, as they're starting to wrap up, uh, but we still need to summarize these disease ratings and really run that statistical analysis. And we also need to incorporate, we're going to take some yield data on these plots um, to see if what we're seeing in terms of decreases in, in green area are related to losses in yield, you know, whether that be in the weight of the yield or even in the you know, the size of the bulbs. And so what we're starting to see from this research though, uh, which we will confirm when we run the statistics and, and see it, how it shakes out, was that really that initiating fungicide programs early at that three to four, five to seven leaf stage probably is, is gonna be the most effective strategy at keeping the percentage of that onion green as long as possible. And then applying these fungicides at seven, maybe 10, let's see, um, day intervals uh, would provide good control. And uh, between the two programs that we looked at, at this point, it's hard to say if there's going to be statistical differences between those two fungicide programs. They seem awfully close in a lot of instances at, at the same initiation or the same application timing. There might be some subtle differences in there to have to check out, but that's kind of the trend that we're seeing here in the season. I guess I wanted to point out that both of those fungicide programs, you know, are involving systemic fungicides right from the get-go, instead of relying on a multi-site early and saving the systemic for later. And we have other research that, uh, you know, I didn't get to share with you that looks a little bit more specifically at that question. So maybe tune in to the Great Lakes Expo I'll put a plug in for that. Take a look at some of the other research that we've also done with this in these symphilium plots. And so with that, I'll turn it over, I guess, you know, at this point we'll take questions if there are any. All right, Doug, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, no problem. Um, Are you guys, gonna, uh, one question that has come up is um, impacts on internal quality of bulb. Is that something you guys might check out? So uh, we do have all the, I have harvest all the bulbs um, and they are drying down and then we're gonna uh, top them and take yield data. Um, so I think in, in that process, and maybe I'll let Mary comment if we're planning to look at rot that's occurring in the storage. Um, yeah, at, at that point, uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Dr. Osbeck comment on that. Yeah, Ben, you know, we'll look generally at bulb quality. Um, we won't go further to actually diagnose what the bacterial pathogen is, but we did see some interesting information last year when we looked at the bulb quality after storing it. Um, and it certainly seemed that if the bulb you know, went into storage having had a lot of foliar blight that we did see a higher incidence of bulb rot. So okay. that, you know, we can report on um, probably in the spring. Okay, cool. Great. Um, you guys got a lot of work done. Um, I know that um, one of our cooperators noticed there are a lot of flags out there and they were 
um, you guys have um, worked together with them and they've worked with you really well. Um, and it sounds like you guys also did a trial looking at timing of those systemic fungicides to see if they should go on earlier or late. Hi, uh, yeah, in our, uh, in our um, another set of, of trials we, uh, that were a little, so that part of the field that I was in with you um, was a little bit behind the, the, the further part of the field. Oh, uh, so gotcha. that wrapped up a little quicker. That's why it wasn't ideal for a field tour, but there were, um, we, there was a, an experiment embedded in there that looked at, at starting with um, multi-sites off the bat instead of, or a systemic and, and seeing which one panned out in terms of green tissue at, uh, left at that point of season. So I'm probably gonna punt that one until the Great Lake Expo when we can put the data together and, and take a look at what's going on there. Um, but, but I don't know, Mary, if you wanna make any comments there. Yeah, sure. Um, so Ben and I have been having some, just um, some broad discussions over the course of the season about fungicides and, you know, I guess when to use the big guns, you know, sometimes growers, of course, the systemic, you know, fungicides, the newer products, you know, can be more expensive. And, and of course, um, they need to be used carefully because of their high cost. And so what happens is sometimes we see the less expensive products be used early on. And then as a disease builds up, then the application of the more systemic um, products happens what and the concern is is that these um, systemic fungicides are more at risk of having resistance developed to them um, by the pathogen and by waiting until the disease and pathogen have built up in the field before using that more systemic product you're actually exposing more of the pathogen at that point in time and you're exerting more pressure on that pathogen population to actually develop resistance to that very, you know, fungicide that you're using at that point. And so I understand that folks, you know, want to use, uh, maybe it's the Bravos or maybe it's the Mancozebs, depending on the crop early on. They're less expensive, they're broad spectrum, but we've always had the inclination that if those are, are used early and then disease builds up, coming in with a rescue systemic fungicide at that point is really not a great practice. Um, so, you know, that's why, you know, I, with Doug and, and working on the onions in, in the one plot, as he said, really developed disease early and just wasn't optimum to share with folks at this time, it's trying to get at that that question, and if, and hopefully, um, you know, assure growers and and show the numbers that if you're going to use that more expensive product early that is systemic, that then you will be rewarded with your yield or bigger bulbs, et cetera. But um, as Doug said, that information will be available for Expo. Um. Mary, thanks. I, I've been having, I'm getting towards the end of my brain span here, having trouble coming up with good questions. But I, one question growers have had is um, um, resistance management and what the role of chlorothalonil is in that as a tank mix. Um, does, should we be tank mixing it with something like Luna or, um, so, I don't know if I'm articulating well, the Luna it. products, you know, already have two actives, right? Now with um, Stemphilium and onions, we've shown in earlier work that the strobularins are not working well and that Stemphilium has developed resistance. So in that case, you know, we have to be cautious and, and help growers, you know, make better choices for stem, Stemphilium control than the strobies. As far as, you know, a lot of these newer products do have two actives. And so I don't know if you necessarily need to have Bravo in addition to that, that pre-mix product. However, we do have some products um, that are a single active that, that may be used. In that case, you know, adding Bravo to that could be useful. Um, and of course, 
you know, we want to make sure that we're staying within the application numbers, you know, that are specified by the label for each product. So there's a lot that goes into it. And so as Doug and I went through our programming, you know, for the different comparisons, you know, we were really keeping that in mind, alternating among fungicides with different, um, that represent the different FRAT codes. So for each spray, we were using um, a product or a tank mix of products that had different activity than the, than the product before. So there's a lot to consider there for sure. Thanks, Mary. Um, well, we got a comment in the chat. Well done. I um, one of oh, here we go. We have a question in the chat, actually, guys. So let me see if I can um, articulate it. So I think the question is. Oh, okay. Um, the question is about mixing insecticides with systemic fungicides. And they're wondering about if the spray tank pH should be buffered to five. Um, now I know there is some concern with Movento and um, chlorothalonil because it has a spreader sticker. I'm not sure if that's where that question is coming from. Um, so maybe there's two parts to that question. Um, is spray take pH is certainly important for insecticides. Does it play a role in fungicide activity at all? Um, the pH of five seems quite low. Um, and so that is not something that we shoot for. Um, now we did do another trial at the site that, um, that Doug worked with where we were, um, you know, collaborating with Sophia Zendre in, in her laboratory. And so we did have a plot where we, where we looked at some um, organic insecticides and some fungicides and stemphilium. And, and Doug, um, if you want to share some observations about that plot just in general. Yeah, for, the, um, for that plot, um, we have pretty good uh, thrip pressure in there. And in, in general, like um, a lot, there didn't appear from the, from Sophia's counts, there didn't appear to be differences in the thrips, but we, what we noticed and, and just kind of noted and wanted to look into um, was that there were a couple of treatments that actually had the green tissue hold on a little bit longer um, than, you know, than others. Um, and so we're, we're kind of wondering if um, there might be some connection between thrips and symphelium in there. Um, and so it was just, it was just an observation that we were curious about um, on that trial. And we'll, we'll have to look into that a little bit more. Uh, yeah, we, we know that thrips um, have been implicated in, in uh, making the Pantoia worse. And there is an older paper that indicates that you know, maybe it's the damage or the scarring um, that then results in stem filling also being worse if the thrips are not well controlled. But at this juncture, that's the best I can answer that unless others from um, Sophia's lab want to join in. No, thank you for the work you guys are doing. And uh, also just a shout out to collaborators who've been working with you guys to make it happen and uh, in a really strange year when everyone's normal mode of operation is different. Um, so thank you, Doug and Mary, for sharing the work you're doing. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, happy to do it. And I, I apologize to the attendee who submitted that question. I, um, I might have butchered it, so please feel free to email it to me or, or one of our attendees um, if we can answer it for you. Okay. Well, I think we are almost to the end of our time together. Um, next, I'm gonna share some work that um, we've been doing in root crops. Um, and this um, to, I started, decided to change the format up a little bit for, for my portion. Um, we have some TV personalities in the family, so I had them interview me 
Um, so hopefully if, if nothing else, um, folks will get some enjoyment out of it. So um, why don't we fire up our, our last presentation of the evening, Craig? Welcome to Maggot News Tonight with Grace Irene and Simon Paul. This evening, our hosts will interview Ben Whirling of Michigan State University. Our topic, Cabbage Maggot. Does anything work besides Lower Span? An MSU exclusive. That and more coming up. Well, thank you, Simon and Grace. I'm glad to be with you today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben Whirling. I'm a vegetable extension educator with Michigan State University. Well, let's talk cabbage maggot. Cabbage maggots are a tough pest for brassica growers. The maggots feed on the roots of our crops, which can cause stunting and leafy and heading brassicas like cabbage and broccoli. While their tunneling causes quality issues in root crops like turnips, rutabagas, and radishes. Oh my God, where did it come from? Good question. Right now, most maggots have formed pupae in the soil near where they were feeding later this summer. These pupae are brown and about the size of a grain of rice and are the fly version of a cocoon. They'll spend this winter as a pupa. Next spring, as it warms up, flies will emerge from the pupae and female flies will then seek out brassicas and lay eggs at the base of the plants. At our study site in West Michigan, this spring flight of flies typically begins around late May to early May and continues on through the month of May. Egg laying by these flies typically peaks around the last two weeks of May. The maggots that hatch from these eggs, or the spring generation of maggots, are the ones that cause the most issues in our vegetables. How does farmers stop it from eating veggies? Well, good question, Simon and Grace. For decades, our vegetable growers have relied on the insecticide chlorpyrifos. There are many generic versions of chlorpyrifos, but this active ingredient is still best known by its trade name, which is Lorsban. Chlorpyrifos can be applied to the soil around planting time and has a long period of residual activity, so it's ideal for cabbage maggot control. But recently, chlorpyrifos has been under intense scrutiny. At the federal level here in the U.S., it remains legal to use and is not scheduled for regulatory review by EPA until 2022. However, Hawaii, California, and New York are already phasing out its use at the state level. There are other reasons to look at alternatives. In Ontario, some populations of cabbage maggot are now resistant to chlorpyrifos. Here in Michigan, it remains an effective solution in some parts of the state. But in others, growers have reported having maggot issues despite using a good rate of chlorpyrifos. What else can farmers use, Daddy? Okay, I know you're anxious for answers, so let's get to it. Let's first talk about leafy and heading brassicas, which are mostly transplanted. For these crops, I'm going to turn to work done at Cornell University in cabbage by Dr. Farouk Zaman. Dr. Zaman has found that Veramark, Radiant, and Entrust consistently reduce damage by cabbage maggot. For Veramark, a single transplant tray drench consistently provided control comparable to chlorpyrifos. Trade drenches with Entrust and Radiant also reduced damage, but they weren't as effective as Veramark. For all three products, control was improved when these transplant applications were followed up with a second application 14 days after transplant. All three products are labeled for brassicas, but Veramark is the only one labeled for use as a trade drench. Veramark also provides good early season caterpillar and flea beetle control. So in summary, growers can use a tray drench of Veramark and consider following this up with a directed spray of either Veramark, Radiant, or Entrust 
Two weeks later, if they are expecting particularly high pressure from cabbage maggot. What were you doing in turnips, Daddy? Daddy, you are seeing. What were you doing? Well, for the past four years, Dr. Sophia Zundry and I have been working with an excellent grower collaborator to evaluate alternatives to chlorpyrifos in turnips. What worked, Daddy? Well, we've went out through various products to hone in on post-plant applications of Mustang Max and Veramark, which have shown some efficacy. When do you spray the horsey one? The horsey one? Oh, you guys mean Mustang Max. Well, we asked that same question in 2019. In 2019, Degree Day Models predicted that cabbage maggot emergence started in early May and continued on through early June. But it predicted that peak activity only lasted for about two weeks in late May and early June. We wondered if growers should start making weekly applications as soon as flies emerge or if they might be able to save sprays and only target those two weeks of peak activity. To answer this question, we compared six applications bracketing the entire spring generation to two that targeted peak. The more intensive spray program initiated as soon as flies were active and continued weekly was more effective than the two spray program that targeted peak. But Daddy, how do you spray it? Another good question, guys. Well, this year we wanted to see if concentrating Mustang Max right where maggots are active when they hatch improves control, or if growers can take the much more practical route and make a broadcast application with their boom sprayer. To test this, this year our collaborator rigged up a three-row sprayer to treat turnips with nothing, a broadcast application at four fluid ounces per acre, or that same field rate but concentrated into a narrow band. The good news is the broadcast application performed just as well as the concentrated band. Did the horsey save the turnips? Well, over the past two years, 43 to 55 percent of turnips were damaged by cabbage maggot in plots treated with only Mustang Max compared to 52 to 68 percent damage in plots treated with chlorpyrifos. You can see that even chlorpyrifos hasn't been holding up in our trials as well as we expected. Here's a picture from this year's trial. As you can see, Mustang Max is better than nothing, but on its own it isn't enough. Should farmers even spray the horsey? Good question. Well, in our 2018 and 2019 trials, we found that the combination of chlorpyrifos at planting time, followed up by Mustang Max and post-plant applications, gave significantly better control than either product alone. So if growers aren't happy with the control they're currently getting from chlorpyrifos, they could follow it up with Mustang Max. Our collaborator tried this program in a high-pressure spot and was happy with it. What about the other one? Well, the other product that has had some efficacy is Veramark. However, performance of Veramark was inconsistent over the first three years of our trials. We think this may have something to do with how Veramark works. It's different from contact insecticides like Mustang Max because it needs to get to the plant roots. Once it's taken up by the roots, it moves upward into the plant. In other words, the plants need to take it up to be protected. Based on this, we thought that applying it in a high water volume drench so it reaches the roots might be important. So this year we directly compared a high and low water volume ap application head to head. Strange enough, both applications reduce damage, so we're still scratching our heads. But it's interesting to note that the single application of Veramark was as good as six applications of Mustang Max and was numerically better than Chlorpyrifos, though nothing looked great this year. Is there anything besides chemistry? Good question, guys. 
Row covers are more effective than any insecticide, and this is proven to be true both for root crops, but also leafy and heading brassicas. A few years back, our grower collaborator covered one acre with floating row cover and left one uncovered to see what it could do. Everything uncovered was treated with chlorpyrifos. Turnips weathered the cold better under the row cover, got bigger faster, and were very clean compared to uncovered ones. The trade-off, of course, is that we control as a pain. Could you stop talking, Daddy? Okay, Simon and Grace, thank you for having me on your show. I did want to close with a few comments. First, I'd encourage growers to experiment now with alternatives while they still have chlorpyrifos to fall back on. Second, I wanted to thank our grower collaborator, who has really gone above and beyond when he already had a long day's work to do. Well, have a good night, Simon and Grace. It's been great talking with you. Thank you for going on veggies, farmers. Good night. All right, folks, well, you've made it to the end of our 2020 virtual um, vegetable and root crop field day. Um, if you have any questions um, for any of our guests, we'd ask you to put them into the Q&A box. Um, if it's easier for you to talk, um, you should be able to click raise your hand and, um, and we will un unmute you so you can speak. Um, um, I did want to mention at the end, um, at the end here, that um, Betsy, who is um, our events management person, who's always does a great job behind the scenes, will place a link in the chat that you can click on, and it'll take you to a survey where you can enter your information to receive credits. And it looks like that has just popped into the um, into the chat box now. Okay, and it looks like this is a question about cabbage maggot. Um, could it help to wait to plant turnips until after the peak? Um, in fact, that's kind of an old, it's, um, there is a old recommendation in um, somewhere here, I have my vegetable Bible, Foster and Flood. They talk about timing planting to avoid peak activity. Um, One thing that seems to be true for root crops is that, um, unlike for our leafy brassicas, they just seem to be susceptible kind of the whole time they're in the ground. But um, just anecdotally in our trials, we, we have noticed that earlier plantings have more issues and that in years when maybe we've been a little bit slower on the gun, we've had less issues. Um, and I think farmers would echo that too. Um, so yes, I think that, um, um, I think delaying planting, if you can do it, um, if you can do that and, and still hit your markets, um, could potentially um, help reduce maggot pressure. We've had plantings um, side by side where one was planted earlier and it had definitely had more maggot issues. Um, Um, another thing that I didn't mention for cabbage maggot, since you've got me on my uh, maggot soapbox, um, um, rotation is certainly um, important. It's not the only answer. I think growers would echo that. They still have issues when they plant in spots that didn't have brassicas last year. But um, at our study site, um, our first study site, we planted brassicas, I think, four or five years in a row, and things didn't get better over time. So it won't eliminate the problem, but it will at least help with it. Um, all right. Um, last thing I'll mention um, is, is that supplemental information um, as well as the presentations tonight will be available. Um, they'll be posted online. Um, in fact, it looks like the link to recordings is already in the chat box. Um, and I am not seeing anything else in, 
Oh, how long to rotate to avoid the issue? Um, so cabbage maggot. Um, we talked about asparagus really early on if you were listening in. That's another specialist. Cabbage maggot is also a specialist. It only feeds on brassicas, which is handy. So really you only need to be out of brassicas one year um, to be helpful. The only thing to note is that um, cabbage maggot adults come with wings, which is, um, which is a pain. Um, and so rotation helps, but you need to rotate far enough away so that they don't um, aren't just flying across the, the road to come to your beautiful brassicas. Um, another, another person um, asked about trap crops. Um, that's a great question. That's actually what I started cutting my teeth in entomology working on um, for another pest. Um, and I believe there's been quite a work, a bit of work done with cabbage maggot um, on that same topic, but Right now, I'm not sure there are any, um, not sure any practical implementations of trap crops. Um, interesting idea, though. The idea is you plant a host that's more attractive to the the pest. Um, it goes there and doesn't go to your main crop. Um, and the last question um, was about contact information for all of our speakers. Um, and maybe that's something that we could, uh, we will talk about including that in the email that we send out. Um, and certainly, I, I believe that our speakers contact info is available online too. But if, if that's something we can do, we will definitely include that in our email to folks. Um, and I think, I think that that will be a wrap. I think I wanted to, um, I wanted to mention that if you have questions for any of our speakers, um, just as that um, attendee uh, might have, please feel free to contact us. Our information is online, um, so please feel free to reach out. Um, and I think that's all I've got for everybody. I know we're in the middle of harvest season, so um, that means work for both our growers, a, a lot of work for our growers, as, um, as well as our researchers. I hope everyone's fall goes well and things go well into winter, and I hope every, everyone's family is safe and well. And thank you for your time tonight, everyone. <laughs>